Hey, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Today, I'm with the great Graham Cochran. How are you, mate? <laughs> I'm good. I don't know about great Graham Cochran. Though. That sounds a little too <laughs> above my pay grade, but I'm doing, doing marvelously, marvelously well. Okay, wonderful. But we just talked a little bit off camera. I'll start with this because we have a mutual really good friend, David Glenn. Yes, and he, awesome guy. And he's just he's one of my favorite people ever. Um, he's just like... He's a, he really does walk the walk and talk the talk, and he's been really supportive, and he's such a great mentor to so many people. And he introduced okay. us officially. Yeah. And what I love about what you do, and we were just talking about this a second ago, is we share that philosophy of creativity is king. I came up as a musician, you came up as a musician, and you got into recording out of necessity, which is exactly what happened to me. Even though that's been my main area has been, you know, recording production stuff, it really came out of the fact that I got two cassette players and recorded them and then four tracks yep. and ADATs and all the things that you did, you have to go through before you get to like DAWs and the revolution of that. Um, so you really have focused and created an incredible brand, I suppose is the word I'm going to use, an incredible thing where you help people out and you bring them, you understand that, you know, with our cell phones, our iPads, our laptops, that anyone can make music. And when I saw your, th what was it called? The $300 recording challenge? Yeah, the $300 studio challenge. Studio yep. challenge. I just felt like that was total genius because it, it was exactly, it was exactly the real world for most of us. Well, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I got I got a lot of flack for that post, though. You did, ironically, and it, it, well, and that's I get I get a lot of flack all the time when I say anything like that. Like you can make a recording for three hundred dollars, because that sort of comment divides where people land on the issue. Uh, people still believe the the mythology that great recordings are a result of great gear, as if that caused the great recording. Right. When sometimes that is related. And great records are made with great gear all the time. But it wasn't the great gear that was what we liked about the record. It was a great song. It was a great mm -hmm. performance. It was a great, uh, great production, great arrangement. People forget how much arrangement affects how good of a song is. And so uh, the whole Recording Revolution concept in that $300 Studio Challenge was more, it's, it's a, very much intentionally saying, look, there are kids with, and when I say kids, literally like 12 year olds making records on $300 worth of stuff that sounds way better than anything I did in audio school, mm -hmm. my, for my first few gigs out of college. Like these, it's because they're super talented, have a great song idea. They, uh, they have a great ear. You can't really uh, buy a great ear, you can only train a great ear. Absolutely. But, when you, but we, we prefer to say if I just bought that piece of gear or I bought, upgraded my plugins or bought, changed my DAW then I'd get a good mix because it's, as, as much as we don't like to spend money, we actually would prefer to quickly buy our way to a better recording or mix than mm -hmm. realize maybe I'm just not very talented or I'm talented but just not developed. And so I'm always trying to just challenge that because I know, I know there's great records being made all the time on, on inexpensive stuff. So that cannot be the common denominator. It must be the people making the music. And I, you know, having been on a side of the industry where I've been making records with, with great artists, um, that's borne out as truth. I'm sitting here in Harmony Studios and, you know, there's this nice knee BCM 10 sitting behind me, but it didn't used to have this. It used to have a pair, I think it still has it down there, a pair, oh no, they've gone. They were these solid state pre's that cost about 500 bucks and I'm blanking on the name. They were a pair, and we had one uh, BAE 1073 in here. And they recorded uh, Someone Like You Here by Adele. So a pair of mics, and she sang live with Dan Wilson, and then she sang two more takes. And my old engineer, Phil, comped it together in like a chunk, like a verse, a chorus, a verse, like bridge chorus. Like, and it was the demo, and eventually they reproduced the song, spending thousands of dollars on orchestra and stuff like that, and they ended up using the quote-unquote demo because it wow. just felt right. And the last time I looked on Wikipedia, it was like number one in 13 countries, right? one song oh, of the yeah, year. The song so, so I mean, that's, good. there's the proof. It's like it was nothing to do with the gear. I mean, it was nothing. And then I always used Lord, like Royals. I mean, 
I mean, really? That could have been done on reason. I think even the guy that recorded it said that she really liked this sort of $200 or $100 cheap mic. I can't, I'd have to go online and check. I'm sure people can leave comments below, please, um, as to what it was. Yeah. But I challenge anybody to say that Royals, one of the biggest hits of the last, whatever, 15 years, could not have been recorded in Reason, Logic, Studio One, you know, you name it. There's, there's no, nothing special about that. It's all about the song. As Quincy Jones yeah. said, the three most important things in music are the song, the song, and the song. <laughs> and, and listen to Quincy. Yeah, he exactly. Knows what he's talking about. Well, and, and it's never a, like, the, I'm never knocking on expensive gear exactly. just because I want to attack expensive gear. People misunderstand what, what we're trying to share, and you're trying to do it too on your channel is, um, it's a message of encouragement. Like, exactly. look, this is the best time to be making music in the history of the world. The fact that we are mm -hmm. alive and making music now, when we had no control over when we were going to be born, it's a blessing that we're, we're just, we happen to be born now. Gear is so affordable and so quality. And like yeah. Signal Path these days with a, with a laptop and a little interface, um, I mean, it's so clean. The noise floor is like non existent. Like, engineers 40 years ago would have killed to have such a clean, yep. beautiful environment to record in. And we can get that for $200, uh, and that means that now it's, it's a level playing field, which is what everybody wants, democratization of music. We all now have an opportunity to make killer-sounding recordings. So the problem is, is that reveals who's really talented and who's not, because now it's not about you know, who got in the good studio or not. The studio is no longer the, the, the barrier or the ledge that's prohibiting people from making great music. Now... If you really do have great songs and you really are talented and you're willing to work hard, it's a hopeful message that, yes, we're living in a revolutionary period where nothing is holding you back, my friend. And that's, I love it because then people can spend a little bit amount of money, not take a lot of risk and start buying a little bit of gear and start practicing and making bad records because you got to make bad records. I still do. To make good <laughs> records. Oh, all the time. I do mixes where I'm like, that sounds horrible. Like, what happened? I'm going backwards, but like you're experimenting and some days you're just off, but there's zero cost to try things now to get your skill level where it needs to be. And, and man, people would have killed to be doing what we're doing 40 years ago. I agree entirely. I just did a, a interview with uh, this guy, Derek Williams, and he, oh, I think it's called That's My Gig. I'll, I'll, I'll plug it for a second because it's a great idea. And he's just trying to bring musicians together to help each other. If you need a player from this side of the world, whatever it is, you can interact. So it's a great, great idea. And he posed this question to me and it really made me think. He said to me, how does it feel that, that you now have access to half a million dollars worth of gear for 300 bucks? And I just thought to myself, wait there, he's completely right. Even now, if I go into a studio in Los Angeles, it's going to have two or three reverbs maybe one, two digital delays. If I'm blessed, it'll have a plate or maybe a chamber. So we've got suddenly six or seven maximum multi-effects. It will have two to four 1176s, an LA2, maybe two LA2s, maybe a Fairchild if we're really lucky. Mm -hmm. After that, that's, that's a maximum most studios have. Now I open up my $300 DAW, and I've got a compressor and EQ on every track. I've got hopefully 10 or 20 instances of reverbs and delays, and he's right. Suddenly, that was a dream when I first started to go into a studio and have four reverbs and delays, let alone, wow. you know, that much stuff. Oh, and the number of tracks you can have and yeah. endless tape, I mean, yeah. without the hassles, yeah, it's yeah. insane. It's, it really is. And then, then one of the other things, and the, the word we're not using, but we're sort of touching on is kind of the dogma. And I think that, mm -hmm. look, I'm not stupid. I do know that some things are better and worse than others. I do think that having a good IO, improving the quality of your IO is going to work, but I'm blown away by how good the IOs are down at that cheaper price. Considering that most people were making records in digital in the late 90s that don't sound as good, that cost tens of thousands of dollars, that yeah. don't sound as good as IOs now that cost a few hundred dollars. And I think that that's very important to remember that, you know, you listen to a heavy rock record from the late 90s done on a, you know, the first kind of Pro Tools system. It's loud and brash and bright. And maybe that's part of the sound, but it also is indicative of the quality of the IO that now, 
I mean, it's incredible what you can do. I, I've gone with my little 2i2 and done um, choirs with my laptop. I did um, a chant in a yoga studio for an album last year, 2i2, pair of microphones. I have not thought there was anything wrong with it. It's been great. T to me, it's like... Oh, the, yeah, the converters that they're putting in these affordable, quote-unquote, budget interfaces are so high quality. I mean, it, it's insane, like what you're saying, even from seven, ten years ago, yep. they, they're incredible. So, And if people... Well, the big part of it is learning how to record and mix properly and digital with gain staging and things like that. And so if you, if you treat your converters nicely, especially the budget ones, you can get great sounds out of them. If you, if you just crank sound through them, they might overload and not sound that nice at, the, at that price point. So just even how you handle them can make a big difference. But yeah, it's, it's, there's so, and there's so much choice, so much choice in terms of your budget, in terms of how many inputs you need. A lot of people don't need more than two inputs. So a hundred, two hundred dollar interface from Focusrite or Personas or any of these guys will, will be great. But if you want to do full drum kit, I mean, there's eight channel mic pre's built into converters for five hundred bucks. Yep. it's insane. I mean, and they sound great. Um, and you, especially since with plugins, you can add the tape saturation and distortion and console emulation that just gives you a lot of that nuance and stuff in the box afterwards. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have additional pre's that are transformer based pre's, you can add a lot of that character. Yep. With plugins, it's anyway, it's a it's an amazing time. To it's be an amazing music. time. I agree. I, for me, I think the the only natural progression is probably one nice. I feel like these days, you, if you had one nice mic pre, you're making you're making albums that are just as comparable. I said this to Andrew Sheps, and he's because he doesn't even sum. He doesn't use any right. summing. That was that was a huge deal that he transitioned in the box yeah. that way. Yeah, and Neil Avron. Neil Avron has the number one record of the Twenty One Pilots, the single and the album. All mixed in the box. Wow. And we're talking about Neil Avron, who made records with T Bone Burnett, who's like Mr. Analog. Yeah. So he's gone from Mr. Analog making the um, you know, Wallflowers albums, mm -hmm. you know, to a point now where he's mixing entirely in the box. And I actually had somebody leave a leave a, a, a sort of like a, a, a message about like, oh, you know, analog rules. And I was like, oh, you know, I left a nice message and I clicked on their uh YouTube channel and their favorite band was 21 Pilots <laughs> or whatever. Is that what they're called? 21 Pilots? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, that's like <laughs> mixed in a box. You know, it's like, yeah. that's the world that we live in. These, these great, and the common denominator is the acquired knowledge that these great mixers have. Yeah. That Neil has made records, you know, with every different style of genre of music. And now we can take all of that acquired knowledge and understanding and apply it to working in the box. And that's the biggest thing that comes from yeah. it is that, because I, I, my journey is, I, I wasn't a natural musician, but I was obsessed. So I just wanted to be great. So I went around and with my guitar to every different kid that played guitar pre YouTube and stole every riff and idea I could. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I identify with the, the, the guys that we talk to because I see that same thing that, if they get the dogma and they get pushed back like, oh, you know, don't, don't even worry. You can't afford the half million dollars worth of gear. You know, if they, if they hear that dogma, I think that's, that reminds me of myself. And it reminds me of just feeling like I'm in this little village in England and I look at America, I look at LA and New York, the music scene and think I want to be over there and I want to be like that. And so I want to encourage my inner child. That's yeah. that, do you know what I mean? I, I, I feel that I respect. When I, when, I, when I make these videos, I'm, I'm just a kid. When I go and talk to Simon Phillips like I did last week, I just, I'm in a room with a guy that's on the records that I bought. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm just like a sponge and I'm listening. And, and, and it's assimilating that information of how they made these great records using great gear and how they're having to do it now and still getting the great same results and sort of filtering that out so we can apply it to our audiences. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One thing I will, will say that I admire about you and I think is, is something maybe we could quickly touch on um, because I know that you, me, and David probably have these conversations is the balance, is the balance between running a business, you know, and with you and uh, with you, you know, running the mentoring business as well as making music and having family and stuff. And I think that's a question I get asked equally as much. Mm by a lot of the, the people that come to me is they're like, how do you do it? They, they, they see me talking about, you know, 
children and being married and, and running businesses and having a couple of guys working for me. And they're just like, how do you balance it? So my question is, how do you balance it? That, it's the hardest thing to do. Um, I, every, every, even to this day, I'm still reassessing priorities. Just last week, I had to get away. I went to a coffee shop and just sat down and just got a yellow legal pad and a pen and was writing out what needs to change about my work weeks because I'll, I'll ebb and flow. I'll be in seasons where I feel like I've got a lot of balance and then I'm coming out of a season where I feel like I've been very heavy in one area to the exclusion of others and it doesn't feel right. So um, it's, 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 I mean, for me, it's like I work for my family. Uh, mm -hmm. I work uh, for them first. So if work becomes my life, then I've, I've missed the primary reason why I work. Uh, there's a lot of secondary reasons. I work because uh, I want to have money to share with others. I love to, to give to my church and other charities and people. I work because I love doing good work that makes a difference in the world. I love the people that support the Recording Revolution. Uh, I work because it's a challenge and we like to like solve problems and feel like I accomplished something. Yeah. Um, there's, and there's a million. I love work because it connects me with people like you. It, it stimulates conversation, getting to bounce ideas off of great minds like yours. Those are all great reasons to work. But the primary reason for me is I work for my family. So if my work gets in the way of my family, I know that's a red flag. Something is out of whack. Um, and also, even if, it, especially if it's work that you like, that's the danger almost. If it's work that you like, you can pour yourself completely into it to the point where you have no life left to enjoy because your work has become your life. And so I've always said that I don't want my life to serve my business or businesses. I want my business to serve my life. So I, I have to reverse engineer, like, what do I want my life to look like? What about my weekends, my evenings? So, like, I want normal hours because I want to have, like, dinner at home with my family every night. And I want to have breakfast every morning with my girls and pack their lunches before they go to school. So I make sure that I, I schedule work in between, you know, like, nine and four or five-ish, you know, like two days out of the week, I leave at 3.30 to go pick up my kids from school um, because I want to have the bookend of my days with my family and I don't want to work on weekends. So it, it's, it's made me, um, I've lost a lot of gigs because of that. Um, there is real consequences. I've lost opportunities. Uh, last year, I traveled way too much and I, I've said no to some things this year that would have been really cool opportunities, um, but it's, it's too much. So I say no to certain things and it hurts. It hurts financially. It hurts, you know, with connections. People are offended that you didn't work with them, and sometimes it's not personal. I just don't have the time. So balance isn't really a good word. It's there's no there's no way to fit it all in. It's like a finite mm -hmm. amount of space. So I have to say no to certain things, and you have to know what you care about the most, and have the courage to let some things fall. Uh, I was always afraid that I would never be able to work in audio because what I was trained to do in school and then in interning in a big studio was become one of the staff engineers and put in the crazy hours, you know, coming in at 10, not really getting started to like noon or one and then going all the way to like midnight and then having to work for free for a long time to get the one paid spot. To, I, I knew early on like that's the only route I could take or the suggested route, but I was about to get married right out of school and I was like, she's never going to fly with that and I want to be around my wife. So I realized, I thought I'll never be able to make a living doing music because it's not going to fit what I value. So I gave up certain things, gave my family first, <laughs> took some jobs that I hated. Uh, but I feel really blessed that after a few years of that, God opened up the opportunities for me to actually, through I call it like a backdoor. I got into music again through a backdoor uh, through the recording revolution. I was already freelancing forever, but it was just for fun and just for extra money. And then this thing showed up where I was just starting to share some ideas with my friends, and it turned into this whole thing. And I've had way more fun. I never wanted to be a teacher, but I was through the back door, found a new way to continue to do music and audio for a living. And it's actually been more fun and more rewarding than the singular linear track I was thinking I wanted to take. So all of that is to say is I'm not perfect at the balance thing. Just ask my wife. Uh, <laughs> but, but I do know what I'm going to fight hard for. And if something gets in the way of, of what rhythms I care about and the rest I need and the time of my family... I will just say that must mean it's not for me because it's not going to work with the life that I want. I think that's wonderful advice. I, 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 I totally understand that we as musicians, because I think we're all musicians at heart, um, operate out of fear. Like, oh my God, if I don't do this, this is going to happen. If, oh, I won't, this won't happen. And 
I've seen a lot of people prey on that. Mm. I've seen a lot of bad people make bad business decisions um, in their careers because other people have manipulated that fear. Sure. I'll be really blunt about it. And and what what I what I really have no problem with doing is having now the industry has sort of completely eroded traditional ways of making income. I think it's a, it's a great time to A, make music like you're saying, but a great time to just be honest and just help each other out. This is a wonderful time to share and, and make this not about our ego because that traditional sort of five guys at the top deciding everything, you know, they, they're limited now to their purely pop world. And for the rest of us, if we're not, if we're outside of the, the sort of singular super pop world, there's a whole different economy there, which is just amazing. And it's like you said earlier, it's a wonderful time to be making music. We're very it is. Blessed. And just to, to touch on that last thing you said, humility, Warren, man, that is so valuable in this economy. If you want to start a small freelance business, or if you just want your music as a band to get heard by people, or if you want to just do well at your day job so you can afford to come home on the weekends and nights and still make music as a hobby, all you will have success if you are humble. And it's so sad that that's like a rarity to be a humble person. And to be humble it is a good thing, meaning you, you don't think too much of yourself. You realize, you know, yeah. I'm not the end-all, be-all of whatever it is I think I am. And it allows you to be focused on other people and like, man, they have a lot to contribute. They're very interesting. And you engage with people as if they're more important than yourself. Uh, and it's a principle that has served me well because I, I have so much to learn. And I have so much oh, more yeah. fun when I'm – Ears open, mouth shut, like, can you tell me more about what you do and how you do it? And I've grown so much by just being open and realizing I don't know what I'm doing. Even with the recording revolution, like, I can only share what I know and what I think might help you. I could be completely wrong and people will tell me if like that's not helpful or whatever. And I'm learning even from my audience. They tell me what they need, what they're struggling with, what they're trying to accomplish. And I've learned a lot even more about our space by just trying to keep my mouth shut, listen, and that'll serve you well at every stage of the game. It'll serve you well in marriage, too, if you want to get married. Just keep it shut, <laughs> listen. But, man, yeah, it's a great time because those who are humble can do a lot in, in this audio space because, like you said, the democratization of the industry and everything has just fallen apart. We're now the talented and the humble and the easy-to-work-with human beings will, will do better. The easy-to-work-with, yeah. That's a, that's a big one. I, I, I try to really reinforce, reinforce that. Be a worker amongst workers, but be easy to work with. So you have a lot of people that follow your channel, follow mine, that are getting into recording and mixing because they want to make their own music. And that's how, that's how we both started. That's how I got into this. I, I didn't care about other people's music. I cared about making my music. Um, and a lot of these people have gotten really good at recording and mixing, developed that as a skill, and what happens is when some of your friends realize you're good at mixing, they're like, hey, can you mix my record or can you record my band? Wonderful. Because you become like the guy that people know in your little circle that, hey, so-and-so has this little mini studio and he's actually pretty good at recording and mixing. And so I've been, for over years of just like teaching this stuff, I've been getting so many emails of people saying, hey, I'm being asked to record like my friends' bands and mix for other people and I'm kind of doing it, but I'm doing it for free and I'm wondering like, can I charge for this? And like... I didn't think I would ever do that, but I think I'm actually pretty good and I have more people that want to work with me. Like, how much do I charge and what do you do? Because I know that you record and mix bands. And, and so all these questions started coming in. So I did some videos and I would answer questions. And uh, I just had continued to get so many of the exact same questions. I was like, look, why don't I just – I've been freelancing. I, have a, I guess I have a unique situation. That, like, I, I continue to work with a lot of independent artists. A lot, they all started with my friends. And so I – I never wanted to be like this big producer. I, I wanted to be, I still want to be a rock star. <laughs> I just wanted to do my own music. <laughs> and recording and mixing was a way for me to make extra money on the side while I pursued my music because I already had some gear. People knew I recorded. So for me, recording and mixing was always fun, freelance side income. And I started doing it in my dorm room at 18. I was in college and I had a little inbox and, and Pro Tools LE. And I was like, hey, I'll record your demo, I'll record your recital, I'll record anything and everything. And I was charging back then. So for the last 15 years, I've been freelancing, and I realized what I thought was just common sense, like, well, you know, I set my rates here, and I do this, and then this is how I pay my taxes, and this is how I reinvest in my business, this is how I get new clients, this is how I raise my rates. I was getting a lot of questions from people that I guess realized that they didn't know a lot of the stuff that I just had stumbled into, because I didn't know it either. Mm -hmm. So I basically put all that together, 
into a, a six-week course called the Audio Income Project. And it's wonderful. Because I didn't see anyone teaching about this. I see freelancing and but sure. I was like, what about our our little niche of of audio lovers that want to transition from there's something I call the freelance arc, right? Where you start on one side, you're doing work for free for your friends and you're getting experience, you're building your portfolio. Uh, and and then that, that's the biggest jump is to go from point one to point two, which is do you start charging for your services? Because no one ever feels good enough to charge. Yeah, that's, I understand. That's sort of the psychological barrier. I'm not good enough. Who am I to charge? Um, so getting people to charge something is important uh, to realize that you should value your work. If you're doing, you're doing a skill that you acquired with the gear you have that provides value, so you've got to charge something. And then getting people to charge really what they're worth and learning how you define that. And then as your career progresses, how, whether you want to do this full-time or part-time, you, you raise your rates over time because you get better and you have more experience and you usually invest in your business. You have more equipment that can do more things. And so it's this whole arc of free to charging something, to charging the right amount, to charging more. And that's just one area of what I talk about in the Audio Income Project. But it's been like a, it was like a course that I didn't know if anybody would care about. I built it for some of my friends and some of these people that were asking me questions, but it's become one of my favorite courses and one of my most popular because a lot more people are realizing, look, I've got my laptop, I've got an interface, I've got gear, and I'm mixing already for other bands. Why can't I leverage this into a, even a side income that at worst would pay for my gear, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> Which is going back to what we were talking about um, and, and, and why I love what you do. Because I sit in my studio and I sit in front of an SSL 4000 and some Poltex and blah, blah, blah. And I joke about it every single day. There is no way, Jose, I could actually ever buy that gear again. No way. Mm. There's not, I, that's taken me 20 plus years to accrue making records. A lot of it was like beg, borrowed and stolen. You know, people, people bringing in something and going, oh, you know, I can't afford to pay for the rest of my record. Would you take this? I mean, I've got guitars from, from that. I think David was joking about the same thing. It's like I've, I, I've acquired gear that there's no way I could do it again. And um, I get asked the same stuff all the time. And I think it's wonderful that you have pulled it together and, and put it into a place where people can focus. Because I think it's also about, for me, is understanding humility and being a worker amongst worker and, and, and remembering that we're serving our customers and our clients. And I think it, it's, it's growing at the right rate because we all want to make a really great living at this, but understanding our knowledge base, because sometimes we overstep it and I'm not quite ready and I want to get paid more than I'm worth. Um, and then other times, and more likely, like you, you're suggesting and, people, and you see with people, is that they are working 15-hour days to make almost no money. And... So it's helping, it's helping define that and creating a way for people to grow. Because my academy is based on teaching people to be creative and not getting, taught, not getting caught up in the sort of dogma of like criticisms of things that are technically based. Because to mm -hmm. me, it's like the technical stuff is actually the easiest stuff to learn. It really is. Yeah. I mean, everybody learns after a few months of doing this that if you boost 60 hertz on a kick it will have a little bit more definition in the mix. You know, it's like if you roll a little bit of lows off some of your guitars, it will free up some area for your bass and you, you kick to live. I mean, these are things that we learn and are easy to technically learn, technically find on YouTube, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but what we can't learn by just watching YouTube videos alone is how to encourage that creativity, how to bring that part through. So for me, it's like I'm really, that's a big part of, of what I believe in. It's like, what we started off talking about is like cultivate an, a, a feeling of creativity being king, that it should all be about making great music. And then where you come in with the, with the audio income project is a great idea is like, how can I monetize this in a way that feels good? Because you're right, even in this day and age, like I mixed Ace Frehley's record um, during the Christmas break and in January, February period, and I'm mixing Ace Freely's record. I don't know if you're a Kiss fan or not, I, it, but you know, it's Ace Freely, you know? And I'm still like putting on a pair of headphones going, is this any good? I don't know, you know? This is gonna get played to like 20 million Kiss fans. This better sound good. You know, I'm second guessing everything I'm doing because that's human nature. 
Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I'm, I'm hardly anyone to tell somebody that I know best. I think that that's Jack Douglas. Um, sorry to ramble on here, but Jack Douglas, one of the greatest producers uh, that ever lived and a, uh, thankfully a great friend of mine, produced John Lennon and Aerosmith toys in the attic and rocks and was the engineer on Imagine. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. you, you get my point. He says to me when I interviewed him, he goes, uh, you call your uh, channel produced like a pro? And I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't want to make it my name. I just wanted it to be general and have people feel like, uh, you know, uh, um, that it's not about me, that it's about serving everybody. And he's like, oh, cool. He goes, but when I grew up, we hated professionals. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I still do. I'm like thinking to myself, wait there, you're Jack Douglas. You produced John Lennon and Aerosmith and Cheap Trick and all the records I grew up listening to as considered to be masterpieces. And he goes, yeah. He goes, the professionals are the ones that wear the suits yeah. and tell you what to do. He goes, I, I like the amateurs. He goes, I like the guys that come in and just plug in and do whatever. Because, you know, you also produce like Patti Smith, like the birth of like punk rock in New York. Yeah. He was there with the New York Dolls. He produced the oh, New York yeah. Dolls. Like everything that was English, the punk rock and new wave, we actually stole from you. We always stole from you. And we stole the New York scene stuff and created our version of punk rock. But it was only us trying to be the records that Jack was making with the New York yeah. Dolls yeah. and Iggy and all that stuff. Yeah. So... It's interesting to hear like a quote unquote professional, one of arguably the greatest producers of all time, tell you that he doesn't like professionals, that yeah. he likes amateurs because amateurs are the ones that just go, oh, so you're supposed to do it like that? What if I do it like this? Oh, yeah. Well, that creativity and, you know, like going back to, it's related to what you said about, you know, anybody can learn the technical, uh, but you can't like easily, quickly learn what should you do in a song and why should you do it and the create, creative part um, I, I, the problem with so many people that are watching our channels is, is that sometimes they're asking the wrong questions. And I ask the exact same questions is, how do I mix a kick drum to sound good? How do I do this? How do I do that? And, and yep. it's hard to transition from those questions to why do I want to do this? And what do I want a good kick drum to sound like? Or what does a good kick drum sound like to me in developing your own taste? It's, it's shifting the, co the conversation away from me learning a, a technical skill to the song. What does the song need? What does it dictate? What is it telling me? Which I know a lot of newbies get, they get frustrated with that kind of answer because it's very ambiguous and vague. But it parallels starting a side business if you're going to record or mix and you want to start charging. It parallels that because when you're, a lot of people, they're like obsessed with, you know, their, their own personal rate, how much they're charging. And, and as much as that is important, because I think most people err on charging too little. They think no one will ever work with them because, they're, again, they're so self-focused. I'm not good enough. I don't have great credits. Who am I? They're always focused on themselves, which ironically is the worst thing for you. Actually, if you focus on your potential clients, what, what are their hopes and dreams as an artist? What kind of music are they making? Reaching out to bands and saying, your music is awesome. You don't know who I am at all, but... I just want to tell you, I love that lick you have when you do this in this one chorus of this one song, whatever. Like, I record bands. I don't know if you'd ever want to work with me, but I would love, I would love to like work on your music because I think your music is going somewhere. I think I can add value to your music. You're, you're not even worried about yourself, you're worried about them. And then you realize you can charge because you add value, right? So if it's all about other people, or it's all about the song. It's never about you and your technical skill or your gear list or your credits or how many years you've been doing this. Um, it's like, so you and I are a good example of this. We both, we share this in common, the teaching and online, the online space. But then in our like freelance or recording and mixing producing bands, you've got talent that are a level talent. You've got guys like Aerosmith and The Fray and, and Howie Day and those kind of people. And, and I've got people that you have never heard of. And so it's very easy for someone to look at you and say, well, Warren knows what he's doing and, and who's Graham Mix or who's he worked with? Well, probably nobody that will impress you, but these are bands and artists that are doing incredible stuff that they still need their music mixed and they still want someone to come alongside them and help produce or mix or even record their stuff. And their budgets might be smaller or their dreams might be smaller, but they still want quality work. And there's still a way for me to add value to them. And that's, that's the question. Can you add value to somebody? Not are you the best, whatever that means. Like even you shared, you, the insecurities are still there. 
I've talked. Dave Pensado Dating. shared it. He, he said, he'll, the, "You know how at the beginning of a mix, and Dave said it too. At the beginning of a mix, you think I'm the best mixture in the world. You're feeling so good about <laughs> it, and then two hours in, you're like, this, 'This, I'm horrible. This is a horrible <laughs> song.' And you'll fluctuate back and forth because it's an art, and we're insecure, and we're musicians. And so everybody has those issues, but it's less about how good am I, and more about is there a place for me to add value in the marketplace? And the the answer nowadays, more than ever, because everyone's recording music, is yes. Yeah, there's a guy that uh, follows both of us called jo uh, Joe Salyers, and he lives in Kentucky, and he made $97,000 last year in his studio in a little town in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky, recording local artists. Yes. And I don't know about you, but I'm assuming $97,000 in Kentucky is like a million and a half in LA. Yeah, that's He's impressive. He's doing great. He works really hard. I, uh, he, he wrote a blog where he just talked about all the different things he does, but he... He multitasks, he does many, many things. And that's another thing that I love to encourage is if you're a musician, you know, we're talking about and you have the equipment, you can be a producer and that's wonderful. You can produce your own material. But more importantly, a lot of producers I used to work with coming up weren't musicians. A lot of these old school guys, they didn't know when I was playing a G minor or a G major. Wow. So as a musician, yeah, I know, um, as a musician, um, now you have a skill set that you can apply, which goes well beyond. So you, it's another, it's a great thing you're touching on because as as a as an up and coming guy and girl, if you look at the credit list of some of these older guys, you can be like, you know, I'm never going to. Firstly, none of those artists are ever going to be that big again. There isn't that kind of industry anymore. Like the Fray, um, you know, God bless them, were one of the last bands that could sell four million albums on their first album. I think, you know, it's Taylor Swift and Adele's world now. They, they do multiple millions, and then a few artists touch a million, million plus, but it's a handful of guys. So the artists that you're talking about working with are at equally as a value and can be just as successful on a local market area because if you own your own record and you sold 10,000 copies, even at iTunes rates, that's $69,000 after they take their cut. That's... That's, that's not a bad payday to go in and make a record in a week. Yeah. So it's, there's a lot of potential. And I do work with, I work with a lot of independent artists that, that do sell several thousand records independently and tour and make money. And there's a, that world didn't used to exist. Mm. It was like, it was either feast or famine. You either were these incredibly successful artists or you couldn't even get into a studio because the only real studios even... Growing up for me, there was like a handful of studios that were maybe half the price of the very expensive sure. studios. But even that was too much for me and my band. All of our demos were four track cassettes. Yep. And that was, you couldn't release that. Some yep. people did, but nobody would buy his, you yep. know, they weren't gonna. But now, as you were saying earlier, you can record even with the, with the little two input, Focusrite, PreSonus, whatever it is, imp, and create something that is commercially viable that can go up, can go onto iTunes, that can be placed on SoundCloud, and you can drive people to your site and sell T-shirts. So many better ways now for artists oh. to make money than there ever used to be. Oh, yeah, there's a guy that follows the Recording Revolution Email me just this week. He's in hun from Hungary. And Wonderful. He, and he'd never recorded or mixed before, um, and he has a band called the Sun City Rockets. And he started watching a bunch of my videos, reading a bunch of blogs, I'm sure a bunch of other people's resources, and decided, you know what, I think I can stab, take a stab at mixing my own band's work. So he recorded a mix on a laptop with uh, a, the Scarlett 2i2, uh, an Audio-Technica 2020, so a $99 microphone, and an SM57, um, so two $100 microphones, and recorded his band, mixed it on a pair of Logitech computer speakers that cost 80 bucks. Uh, nice. Didn't even have any proper monitors. And, uh, and he shopped it out to a bunch of labels in Hungary, and every label there was interested, and one of them, which is a subsidiary of Warner Music, signed them and liked his mix so much, they said, let's not even change the mix, we'll keep your mix, we'll just send it to mastering. And they shot a music video, and they're, they're like blowing up now in Hungary, and he, he did it on $500 worth of stuff, and he never mixed before. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> th th this kind of stuff is, is happening uh, because yep. they had, it's a great song, he had, had a great ear. If you listen to his mix... He just he he knew what good records sound like. You could tell he's listened to a lot of great pop records and what he did going into the chorus, uh, like the vocal split out and get wide, and then a lot of just the guitar parts sit nice in the sense. He understands music 
because he's a musician, I could just tell the whole band gets it and he mixed it the way he would want to hear it. And to me, that's, that's where the magic is, is when people overthink, like, gosh, I'll never be good at recording or mixing, or I don't understand all these technical things. I don't understand a lot of technical things. That's why I teach things the way I understand them, and I guess that resonates with a certain population of people. But some people criticize, you know, you're not you're not smart enough. Or why don't you talk about X, Y, and Z? Because like I don't understand that. That's why I don't talk about it. I just teach what I know. But that's empowering if you realize: Can you listen to a lot of records? Do you know what they mm-hmm. should sound like? What, what do you like? And then when you're mixing, you know when it's not there yet, and that's frustrating. But you can push it and tweak and figure it out, and then you know when you've arrived because you know when it sounds like your favorite records. And that's that's the earpiece. That's the, the the vision that you have to have. You don't have that. It doesn't matter what gear you have or how much you've worked. You'll never get a good record. So to me, it's you have everything you already need to make a great record in here, and all the yeah. stuff that you grew up listening to. That's what shapes mm-hmm. the way you hear music. And I wish people would just tap into that more. Usually, we're we're too afraid. We're like, oh, am I going to do this wrong? I'm going to get a bad mix. It's like, well. Like going back to trust death, your ears, trust your yeah. ears. Do trust do what ears. sounds cool yep. to you, and that really is legitimate advice. It's not just pie in the sky. That's the best advice I could give. Oh, it's wonderful advice. I've got to I've got to tell tell a silly story. I because I, it it touches on it. So my my wife's um, father goes on a cruise. He goes on the cruise, and I'm sure you've had this happen to you. You know, family and friends they sort of throw you under the bus. There, there's a, there's a, a a guy on the cruise ship and he's doing covers and he's, he's doing great versions of the covers. And of course he has a CD. So my wife's father takes the CD, makes a promise to the guy that I'm going to listen to it, review it and give him <laughs> help in recording, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> all this thanks. kind of stuff. And, and, and maybe, you know, maybe there's some songs on the CD that I could give to different artists or something like that. He makes this promise um, to the to this uh, this guy that I'm going to review and and you know and I know all these people and I'm going to help you know and like the the way that things that father-in-laws do I'm sure oh, yeah. mar- the married men amongst us understand what that and the married ladies what father-in-laws can do and um, so of course he gives me the CD and uh, so I'm driving one day it's been a week or two and I was like you know I'll put on the CD so of course I put on the CD and you know. Um, it's dreadful. I mean, you know, it's really bad. I'm just being honest. It doesn't sound very good. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like going, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be constructive. I'm going to say this, this, and this, and I'm going to try and help out. But first thing I do is I call my father-in-law. So I call my father-in-law. I was like, Hey, um, just listen to the CD. He's like, Oh, great. I'm really glad you listen. I've been promising him that you're going to give him a critique, you know? And I was like, First thing I have to say, um, George, um, is um, what did you think of the CD? And George goes, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's really awful. And so I said to him, I was like, well, then what, why did you, why did you, what did you think I can add? I can help and stuff. He goes, oh, he goes, but I'm not a professional, so I don't understand music. Man, that's hard. And I'm just like, that, that's what we're facing. You know, it's like you, you hit the nail on the head. I just wanted to completely reinforce your statement yeah. because the, the, there's my father-in-law who's, I don't know, 65 years old, grew up on the Stones and Led Zeppelin. He knows music. You know, his age group, he was in the 70s, you know, when all of these bands that we, we, we consider to be the greatest bands, the Pink Floyds and the, and the Stones and the Aerosmiths and all of this, the greatest bands, rock bands at least, and he was a fan of all of that. And so he has got, a great sensibility. He listens to the CD. He thinks it's dreadful, but he doesn't think that his opinion is of a value. Mm. And I'm, I'm on the phone with him going, no, yours is the only opinion that matters. Yeah. My opinion actually doesn't really matter because I'm not the great American public. Mm. You are. You may or may not buy this CD. And I, I, I was like, your, your advice to this guy is probably as valuable, if not more valuable than mine. All, all I can do is go, well, technically I can help you. But really, the most important thing is, sorry, you know, the songs aren't very good. This isn't your genre. You know, all the things that he knew instantly as a as a listener, as an educated listener who loves music. Oh, and you you hit it on the head, too, Warren, is that like the judge of whether something is good or not is the average person that's going to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones that buy it. They're the ones that stream it on Spotify. Oh, yeah. And, and And they listen to different things than we listen to. We obsess over frequencies and we obsess over 
you know, width and depth and, and things that are real, but my wife and she's a musician too, but she doesn't hear any of that stuff. She just listens mm -hmm. to the vocal. And does she like the lyrics and the melody and then maybe the beat or is it, is, yeah. is it too loud or too quiet? Like these are very, <laughs> very broad strokes that she paints a song, a mix that's good or bad. And sometimes that's a perspective that we need is that, that average person's audience perspective when we're so dialed into riding faders and, and tweaking settings and, Things that, that make a big impact, I'm not trying to minimize those things, but you know, we lose our perspective so quickly. And when you're like, hey, what do you think about this? Dude, this is awesome. If, if, that's, if it's awesome, you've you got to at least be in the ballpark to like close that mix up because there's not much else you think you're adding something to it. And all of us audio geeks might go, oh, yeah, that's cool that you added that. But does the average person hear it, feel it? Again, it's already there, hopefully, in the recording phase. Is it a great performance that sells the song in an arrangement and a recording that supports that vocal performance and makes you want to move or have that emotion that it's supposed to convey. None of that's really done by magical tips and tricks inside the mix. Yep. I, 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 every producer that I've worked with that I admire has a, always has a story that's similar to what we were talking about. Dave Jordan would always say, he's always say, as a teenage girl, I'm going to listen to this on the beach. That, I, that's his that's thing. That's awesome. On the beach. That's like, awesome. Like put it, I think for his age group, he's probably thinking like boombox yeah. on the beach. Like, yeah. yeah. They, and I think the thing is, is what it is, is you don't understand it because you, you, you live in Florida. Yes. <laughs> it's, that, it's that like when you, everybody else can hear the music you're listening to, then it's good. Yeah. It's like when a guy's driving past you in the car and the music's blaring, he's telling you. This is good. This is good. This is who I am. Yeah. I'm proud to be listening to this. Yes. So if a teenage girl is blasting their music out on the beach, then you know it's good. Um, yeah, I, I love that stuff. Uh, Steve, for, for excuse the name drop, but Steve Perry said to me that he had hired, um, I don't remember which one, I'm sorry, but one of the Holland Dozier Holland guys, because he's a huge R&B and soul guy, loves Motown, his whole aesthetic. And even though he's a rock singer, he comes from that yeah. thing. That's what he loves. And so he'd hired them to do vocal production with him. And I don't know what record, journey record what it was, but he said he was struggling with this phrase, you know, trying to get one of these runs. And as you know, he's got an incredible voice. So he's trying to nail this run, gets frustrated. And he said that the producer just leaned in and, you know, t I got this visual of this guy like leaning in and hitting a button and just says, you know, Steve, all we're trying to do is sell a feeling. <laughs> I just love that. Awesome. It's like, yeah, because uh, look, I get caught up in the technical. I will say, you know, when people ask me about DAWs and skills and stuff, I, I do always say this. I think it's important. You have to know your DAW back to front because oh, yeah. when you're still watching the stuff and you're still looking at things too much, you're, you're not listening. That's the one thing I will say of all the technical things, just, just know whatever your DAW is because, look, I've got friends that are moving from Pro Tools to Studio One. I've got people from moving from this to that, you know, um, logic for some people, um, reason still popular with a lot of guys, and they're all making great music. Now, whatever your platform is, as you know, we, we, we tend to go into Pro Tools because you move from one studio to another, everybody has it, and, and it definitely is a somewhat of an industry standard with studios and stuff. But a lot of this music we're talking about is recorded on all kinds of oh, DAWs. Yeah. Um, so whatever your DAW is, I definitely think you have to know it as well as possible so you're listening more. Oh, yeah. That's don't the want only to thing change. I... It, it, the problem is the marketing. The marketing is always, it's always new DAWs or new features, and, and we always want change. So we're, sh we're shopping DAWs. But I always sure. think of it like changing your console. If you're used to working on an SSL, would you really yep. go swap it out and buy a Neve just, just because someone else right. made a good record on a Neve? Like, even if that was financially viable – you have to get used to where the EQs are and, and what the range yeah. is. Like you're already used to grabbing it and you know if you push the mix bus on the SSL a certain way, why change it? Not that So it's yeah. the same thing with a doll. Like I, people ask, why do you use Pro Tools? Why don't you use something else? And well, I've been using it for 15 years. I, I know it really well. So why give me a good reason to change where it's going to handicap me and slow me down and move me away from thinking sure. about music and now thinking about menus and colors and what you just described. So yeah, best advice is, is be empowered to know that there's people making real records on every DAW. I have a friend in Miami, Ill Factor, who makes music, all the stuff is on Ableton. And he's, he just made a record, a rec oh, Sia, yeah. and on Ableton. That's all he does. And to me, Ableton confuses the heck out of me live. It's, it's, but 
that's what he does, and he's really good at it. So why change? It all sounds good. Yeah, I do think. Yeah, I, I have. We have a kid, uh, Matt, who works for us, who is an Ableton guy and makes incredible music on it. And again, when I when I open it up, I look at it and go, "What's going on here? Um, it doesn't work." I think guitar players, and I'm generalizing, so it, uh, there's no absolutes, but I think guitar players like or really gravitate towards Pro Tools because of the audio editing. It was like a leveler for us. Suddenly, we were like keyboard players. We could edit our guitar playing in the same way a keyboard player could edit the MIDI on there. Yes. For me, that was like a big thing. And when I, when I worked as an engineer with Dave Sardi, he said to me that the best Pro Tools editors were always guitar players. And he said because they thought in a way of push and pull, where I think with key, not every keyboard player, I don't want to blanket make the statement and offend every keyboard player, but I think a lot of keyboard players that are used to the MIDI world are used to sort of correcting everything and making it very perfect. But when you're working in rock and roll, you know, as guitar players, we're used to, and we like things sometimes being behind and sometimes being on top, you know. Yeah. That excitement of a guitar just being, like a guitar stab just being ahead of the snare as opposed to on it or behind it, yeah. you know. That kind of mentality, um, for him at least, he, it makes sense because the records that Dave makes, uh, you know, Jet, we did some Jet, we did Hot Heat together and the Thrills, these are all like, sloppy yeah. rock and roll bands, yeah. you know. It's, it's wonderful. I, 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 I'm blessed every day to do this. I mean, it, this is a, a, a miracle that I've came from this little village in England to, you know, looking at the back of records in, in Los Angeles, looking at like LA studios and New York studios to sitting, you know, to be sitting in LA, you know, where people made, those oh, okay. made that music and made those records. It's, it's a wonderful journey, and I, I hope that we can help other people have that journey. Oh, and it's more, more people will have that story now than ever, I think. Wonderful. Look, well, thanks ever so much for your, your time. Um, of course. It's been awesome, Warren. Thanks for having me on, man. It's an honor. It, oh, it's an honor to have you included in, in my show as well. It's, uh, you know, you, there's a lot that you do that I aspire to. I'll be honest. It's like a, it's a, it's, it's a huge deal, and to have a mutual friend in David, and 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 to find out. I spoke to Tim Pierce the other day, mm -hmm. and I told him some of the stuff that David had said about you, and he he said to me, he goes, "That is so amazing to hear." You know, just your philosophy and your success and everything. He said it's just like he said it was inspiring to hear. Wow! And Tim's a very talented, as you know, the, probably the most successful session guitar player in the world. And he's a fan of yours, so I just think that that's a that's a, that's a nice world. That's a nice. Yeah, it's a, that's crazy. It's a small world. Yeah. I still think it's just my yeah. mom and my brother that watch my videos. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> like, who's out there watching these things? But it's it's awesome. It's cool to do what we do, and I, I love that you're in this space and you're helping a lot of people. I have so many people tell me, "Oh my gosh, I'm re I'm loving Warren over Produce like a pro. He and you are like my favorite resources or Pensado's place." Or, and when, when I started yep. hearing that about a year ago, I realized this guy, and I would watch your videos and read your articles and realize, here's another guy that's actually trying to actually help people. Because you can sniff them out. You know the people that aren't really trying to help. They're just trying to do something, yep. and you're actually helping people. And, uh, and that's, that's the proof when people who follow your stuff say, I did what Warren said, and it worked, and I'm getting results, and they're loving it. So kudos to you, man. Thank you ever so much. And, but what's so funny is like, I'm just like you. Sometimes I do something and I'm like, oh, I don't know. I could have done that better. Oh and, and then I learn something a week later and go, I should probably go back and change that slightly. That's what I always just try to say. And if I'm commenting back, it's like, this is just my version or opinion on something. I mean, there's, uh, as my grandfather used to say, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... There's so many ways to get the end result. And ultimately, as we, we both practice what we preach, it's all about the creativity. 100%. It's... Well, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's Have cool. a marvelous time recording. I will. I'll make sure it's marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> if you name drop a marvelous in, in, in one of your videos, I'll, 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 I'll be truly blessed. I'll be like, yay. I'll send you royalties every time I say marvelous. <laughs> My friend Jason, who uh, was over at Lars for years, he just left. He... He, he, he writes to me, he goes, I hope you're having a marvelous day. And he puts like a little <laughs> trademark symbol on it. That's awesome, man. I love it. That's true. I will. I will keep it marvelous. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you ever so Thanks much. I really more. appreciate yeah, it. Take care, bud. Please, everybody, leave some questions and comments below as ever. And if there's anything that's uh, burning, I'll see if I can get Graham to answer it. <laughs> He'll be like, don't do that, Warren. There'll be hundreds of questions. <laughs> All right. Have a marvelous time. Thanks, mate. Yep. Take care.